Good evening, everyone. I'm Hasi Patel, HOSA's Western Region Vice President. On behalf of HOSA, we're very excited to welcome back the American Board for Certification in Orthotics, Prosthetics, and Pedorthics, a HOSA partner over the past year. The U.S. World News recently ranked orthotics and prosthetics as the 16th best job in the country and the second best in healthcare. Prosthetics, orthotics, and prodorthics is a fast-growing, exciting, and challenging healthcare career field, and we're very excited to have ABC and the What is Pop team with us today to, to discuss the many different career paths you can pursue. These individuals were just like you a few short years ago, figuring out what they wanted to do with their careers. They are here to answer your questions and tell you all about this incredible career field. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Megan Machovich, the Marketing and Communications Manager at the American Board for Certification in Orthotics, Prosthetics, and Pedorthics. Thanks, Hasby, um, and good job pronouncing all of those all of those words. They're, they can be tricky. Um, good evening, everyone. I uh, am Megan Matovich, as Hasby said, and I am with the American Board for Certification in Orthotics, Prosthetics, and Pedorthics, or ABC as we're called for short. Um, I'm really excited to be joined by some really great panelists this evening um, who are gonna talk to you all about what it means to work in prosthetics, orthotics, and pedorthics, also known as POP. Um, so individuals who work with prosthetics, orthotics, and pedorthic devices help people move and live better and with more ease. These POP professionals design, build, and custom fit braces, artificial limbs, and footwear to help people born with mobility challenges or those recovering from diseases or injuries. So there are a variety of different POP careers that incorporate healthcare, engineering, therapy, and more. You'll hear from several POP professionals today who come from a wide range of backgrounds and have different career paths. So if you attended the International Leadership Conference uh, in Houston back in June, you may have met some of today's panelists. You'll hear about their personal journeys, how they discovered POP, and why they pursued a career in the POP profession. You'll be able to ask them questions toward the end of the webinar, and to submit those questions, you can do so in the Q&A feature. And now, I would like to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, today's panelists are Althea Biondich, Jordan Kokos, Sydney Izel, Ahmad Najwa and Riley Weldon. All of them are at different stages in their POP journey, and we'll hear from each panelist about their personal journey before we're going to bring everybody back together for a panel discussion. So to kick things off, uh, let's start with some introductions. We'll start with uh, Althea. Let's, uh, let's go to you first. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How, how did you find POP, and can you uh, talk about where you are in your POP journey? Hey, hi everyone. Um, so I, I studied exercise science in college and uh, originally I planned to pursue a career in physical therapy. Um, and um, through that journey, uh, working in the field as a, as a tech, I um, actually, um, I thought it was a good idea to transition into orthotic fitting just because I, I had no idea about it. And um, I was encouraged by um, the people that I worked with to try it. And um, I basically, I fell in love with um, operating devices and helping people uh, um, use these different devices in order to overcome whatever disability or uh, ailment that they were uh, 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 having. So I basically, I love the independence that POP gave me and um, being able to um, increase my confidence in the medical field as well. Awesome, that's great. So what would you say is a day in the life like for you? So I come in in the mornings and uh, I usually go through my charts to see if I have to um, look at patient profiles and um, update anything that I need to based off of um, uh, charting notes. Um, I usually um, do maybe technical modifications to different devices, orthotics, um, prosthetics, and, and uh, all this such of like that. Um, and uh, yeah. 
So your, your situation is a little bit different um, than some of our other panelists. You are working in a hospital setting, right? So instead of a, a clinic or you've worked in a hospital setting. So you want to talk a little bit about that, like what a hospital setting looks like versus a clinic? Yeah, so I worked in both and uh, hospitals are um, very different just because you have to be prepared and you have to come in with uh, all the supplies that you need. Uh, it, it may not be as easy enough to do modifications to a device just because you don't have the big machinery or um, the type of uh, like the small components that you kind of have in the lab to, to make that um, like a, a, a cut a lot cleaner or um, that specific pad that you need. So working in a hospital setting is just a little bit more um, challenging uh, but if you see patients in your clinic, um, you have all your supplies ready uh, right in front of you um, just to, you know, and you're able to take your time to, to go through the process for each device. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's a different, you know, a whole different thing to be in a clinic in a hospital, but still, still cool both ways. Um, yeah, definitely. Seeing definitely. Patients. Um, so what would you say is that the thing you love most about pop? Oh, well, I love, I love the, um, the mobility that it gives people. Um, uh, and then especially if, if, you know, they've gone their entire lives being able to do a certain thing, activity physically, um, mm -hmm. and this device, whether it's, a um, uh, a better fitting shoe or, you know, uh, in our thought, an AFO, an ankle foot, or ankle foot brace or uh, a whole new leg. This, uh, those devices will provide people with the mobility that they once had, or at least it gives them hope that they can achieve that, that mobility again. So I just love the, the entire process of it. That's a great answer. Yeah. Giving people back their mobility. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Althea. We're going to um, introduce Jordan. And Jordan, how did you find a uh, find pop? And uh, what are you doing now in your career? That's a great question. Uh, and I, I just want to start off by saying I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Uh, it looks like there's a ton of participants. And, and I get the pleasure of telling you about what I believe is the coolest area in the medical field. So let me tell you a little bit about how I got into this area in the medical field, because I took a little bit of a different route than most people take. So I began my career as a mechanical engineer and got my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. While I was getting my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, I was volunteering with organizations like Go Baby Go, which is an organization that makes these little ride-in cars for children with disabilities so that they can find their own mobility. And I was the co-founder and co-president of an Engineers Without Borders uh, chapter <clears throat> at my university. So through both of those things, I was faced with this big question, a question you might be asking yourself now, which is what's next? I'm graduating with this mechanical engineering degree. I have this deep pa passion for helping people, for these children with disabilities, for these people around the world in underserved communities. And I found this wonderful way to use my engineering skills as well as develop skills in the health profession and really bring back mobility and make a difference in people's lives. So through a lot of searching, I found prosthetics and orthotics and decided that that's what I wanted to do with my career. I wanted to spend every day helping people using my mechanical engineering skills as well as my artistic skills to bring back mobility to those people. Yeah, that's awesome. We have a lot of people in the pop profession that come from an engineering background. So, yeah. Um, what would you say a day in the life is like for you? I, again, just have the coolest job in the world. I also work in a hospital setting in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I work for a hospital called Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. And what I get to do every day is uh, it, it really varies. And that's one of my favorite things is that every day I'm doing something different. So on an average morning, I might jump right into a patient appointment and be evaluating that patient and deciding what is the best device for them. For example, if they're missing their leg, I get to evaluate them for the type of prosthesis I get them. I might be asking them questions about what the best knee is for them, what the best foot is for them. 
And then after that interaction with that person, having that really face-to-face -face interaction, I get to go into the back of the clinic. And the back of an OMP clinic is very comfortable to an engineer because we have all sorts of tools. We have grinding machines and any wrench that you can imagine back there. And I get to start to flex my engineering muscles as well as my creative muscles. Uh, in this field, we make very specifically tailored to people's body parts devices. And the way that we do that is we make molds and copies of them with plaster. And so we get to take that plaster and just use our artisan tools, literally the same tools artists used to sculpt. And we get to sculpt these wonderful shapes for them and then create devices using those shapes to help that patient. So we have a lot of forward facing things with the patients as well as a lot of engineering and a lot of creativity using uh, artisan tools and shaping. Hey, so what is some advice that you would tell your younger self? Now that you're in this profession that you love, what would you tell your younger self? Yes, I took a little bit of a roundabout way and took too long to get here, uh, if I'm honest. So um, advice I'd like to give my younger self and advice I'd like to give all of you is, one, you're already doing the right thing. You're one of the 74 participants in this meeting. Continue to pursue these kinds of meetings. Continue to pursue those extracurricular activities that are going to set you apart. Number two, one of the realest things that you can do, and I'm sorry to say it, is keep your grades up. Grades really do matter. <laughs> The grades you get now are going to help you get placed in the college that you need to be in. Then, then those grades matter as well. So just keep on top of your studies. And then finally, volunteer. I think volunteering is a great way to not only set yourself apart in an application, but to also get real world clinical experience as young as you can. There's plenty of people that are willing to accept high school students as volunteers for their organization. You can look for uh, volunteering with people with disabilities in sports. There's a lot of adaptive climbing programs in the U.S., a lot of adaptive cycling, or like I mentioned, Go Baby Go is a great one to get involved with. And you'll find that you get to meet these patients, meet their care team, and really be a hands-on member of that care team very early in your journey. That's great, Jordan. Yeah, we hear that a lot um, from our current clinicians, that they really, really get a lot out of volunteering, not just the fact that they are giving back, but they're also getting a lot from it, the connections that they make with other clinicians and other um, people. So yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Um, okay, thank you, Jordan. We're gonna move on to Sydney. Okay, Sydney, uh, let's see, how did you find POP and what are you doing now? All right, also like Althea, um, undergrad, I did exercise science and I thought I was going to do physical therapy because I had had a lot of physical therapy. <laughs> so I was like, yep, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, and then my junior year, my mom ended up having to have her leg amputated. So I saw how her relationship was with her prosthetist and I just looked and I was like, that seems kind of cool. I think I might like that better. So that's all she wrote for me. Yeah, that personal experience, that makes a difference sometimes, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what would you say a day in the life is like for you? Like Jordan said, every day is different, which is lovely because then I don't feel like I'm ever bored because I, I never mm -hmm. know what the day is going to bring. I feel like in our career, we wear so many different hats. Sometimes we're seamstress, we're engineers, um, we're counselors. Sometimes our patients just want to talk to us. They don't really have anything, but they just need to come and talk to somebody. So that's us. But I guess typically for me right now, I also have residents under me. So my day is different now, but I'll come in, I'll do charts, um, my charts and reading their charts. Uh, and then I normally see about, depending on the day, four to eight patients. But with me having residents, I have to give them some. So I'm it's more of me observing and being a teacher now. So I have to be a little bit mm -hmm. more hands off and I'm I'm enjoying enjoying this new journey of teaching. Mm hmm That's great. Okay, so something unique about your pop journey. Do you have anything you want to tell us about that? Yes. Um when I was in OMP school, orthotics and prosthetics school, um 
my second, my, the year before my second year, I went to Ecuador on a, like almost like a study abroad um, mm-hmm. and I used to volunteer with an OMP program over there and I loved it. Absolutely the most humbling experience I've ever had in my life. Healthcare over there is way different than in the U.S. and I'm, I'm very grateful for what we have. But while I was there, it was nice because we ha- we have so much access here to everything. Mm-hmm. We're not limited. And in Ecuador, they can't. They have to get their plastic from Colombia. They can't even make the plastic in Ecuador. They can't have half of the tools we have, so they have to get things. We bought over a lot of things as volunteers, and. It's just nice to see the ingenuity of them not having all the things we have here is amazing. Like you really have to think outside the box when you don't have everything right here. And I just got to meet some amazing patients and it was, it was an amazing experience. That's awesome. Really cool. All right. Thank you, Sydney. And next we are going to talk to Ahmad. So, um, Ahmad, tell us a little about you. Um, how did you find Pop? What are you doing now? And where are you in your in your journey? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm originally from Afghanistan, and there's a lot of, um, especially children, landmine victims there. So growing up, I was exposed to um, amputees at an early age and prosthetics at an early age. My father there worked for the Red Cross. Um, so I was kind of uh, aware of the field. Um, and then when I came to the States uh, for my uh, schooling, I went, I got my bachelor's in technology and applied design. And our my capstone professor in our last semester challenged us to pick a project without thinking about, um, pick a project in terms of a job that we wanted without thinking about the compensation or pay, anything like that. So I kind of went back to um, what I knew from back home, which was prosthetics. And that was my final project. Um, And I was lucky enough to find a job in the field as a technician about seven years ago now. Uh, So um, I work in a central fabrication uh, environment, so I don't see patients. Um, Unlike some of my fellow panelists, we uh where i work we only build devices so if you enjoy power tools uh that's that's mm-hmm. kind of the place to be yeah and you do some like 3d printing and some other sort of tech things too in your yeah yeah so uh 3d printing is kind of making uh really a lot of inroads into orthotics prosthetics and pedorotics right now it's growing exponentially uh, we started uh, 3D printing some devices about four years ago now, and they were at that point looking for someone in the company who had some exposure to 3D printing. And my name came up just because of my um, degree uh, from school. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's 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 very exciting time to be in the field because there's a huge amount of new tools, new technologies coming in. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so day in your life, what would what does that look like? Uh, I'm going to echo my fellow, fellow panelists here uh, again. It's it's different. So today, the majority of my day was spent tuning a 3D printer. So, <laughs> so not 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 exactly directly related to ONP, but it's a tool that we will use uh, to print patient devices. Uh, but normally, my regular day, uh, I get work orders from uh, practitioners, uh, clinicians. Uh, Mm-hmm. People who see the patients, they send us work orders. Um, they send us scans of the patient's limbs. We rectify or modify those based on the practitioner's uh, requirements. And then we print the mm-hmm. devices and send them out. Yeah, very important piece. Some some clinics don't actually have uh, a full fabrication set up at the clinic. Yep. So they turn to... Um, groups like yours that they can have the the pros work and get those uh, devices made for their patients. Yeah. Or if it's a hospital cool. setting. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So what do you like most about pop? Uh, I initially, I really liked it because I got, got to work 
with my hands, with a variety of tools. My job these days is more behind the desk since I'm doing a lot more CAD work. Uh, what mm -hmm. I really like though is everything we make is a one-off custom device. Uh, every piece that you make is made for an individual and people are different. So there's essentially no repetition in your job. Every, mm -hmm. every day it's a fresh, fresh start. Yeah, that seems to be a theme amongst uh, the panel is that it's new and different kind of every day. So mm -hmm. that's cool. All right. So advice for a future pop professional. Do you have any? Um, I would, uh, again, uh, my my fellow panelists gave some great advice there. I'd like to echo Jordan. Uh, if, if you can, just Google, look for uh, a clinic in your area, reach out to them. Almost every practitioner uh, I know, clinician I know, I won't turn down um, any person who wants to shadow or follow them around. Just try to gain some exposure in the field because there are a wide variety of roles within uh, the POP field. You can be in a clinical setting. You can be in a fabrication setting. So it depends on what you want to do. Um, you can fill a wide variety of roles. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, okay, so last but definitely not least is Riley Weldon. Okay, Riley. Hi. So how did you find POP? And can you talk a little bit about what you're doing right now? Yeah, so I've always been interested in healthcare. Didn't really know exactly where I wanted to be. Um, grew up in a military family, traveled all over, didn't really have anything. Um, leading me anywhere, knew I wanted to give back to the community that I grew up in, so the veterans and all of that, um, but I didn't want to go into the military. So started shadowing, found a family friend um, that worked in prosthetics and orthotics and went and shadowed at his clinic and just every day, every um, patient appointment, the day got a little bit better, a little bit better. At the end of the day, I got to shadow or watch a gal get fitted with a computerized ankle that had been wearing a prosthetic for probably 30 or 40 years. Wow. And this computerized ankle learned as she walks. So it could pick up the toes more as she walked up or down stairs to make it easier. It would also adjust to ramps. The end of the appointment, we were outside, beautiful day. She turns around and goes, I can finally hike with my grandkids for the first time again and had this massive smile on her face and I was sold. <laughs> it was like, I want to be able to give that smile to people. <laughs> that's awesome. 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 Yeah. That's kind of hard to, to not want to want to do that every day. Yeah. So speaking of your day, what would you say you, a day in your um, pop life is like? Yeah, so I work at a clinic. We're a pretty unique clinic in the field of prosthetics, orthotics, and podorthics. I work directly with physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and behavioral therapists right in the clinic. Um, our therapist side specializes in pediatrics. So, you know, we see eight to 12 patients a day. Some of those may be doing therapy in the middle, some... Um, you know, may have behavioral issues. So you've got the parents, the behavioral therapist in us, just kind of everybody working together in this very much team environment. Um, so you get a lot of people kind of helping you out with the design, but at the same time, you're the expert. So getting that discussion going and what's best for this kid as, you know, we see them for 10 or 15 minutes in the day whereas the therapist sees them for 30 minutes or an hour twice a week. So it gives you a better idea yeah. kind of what the kids are like. And then I also see adults as the other half of my day um, for anything from shoes to prosthetics, um, kind of all over the board. Everything is different. Like everybody has said, <laughs> no two days yeah. are the same. Yeah. And really uh, collaborative, it sounds like. Yes, yeah, this is very collaborative, um, which, you know, unique one way or the other. Some people love it, some hate it. I'm one that I, I like having the therapist right there. Great, great. 
Okay, and is there one thing that you would want any uh, want everybody listening to know about Paul? One um, takeaway. Yeah, so I would from say that. it is a <laughs> it's a great mix of engineering, art, medicine, computer, graphic design. It's a mix of left brain and right brain. Um, I had you know classmates going through school that came from the art and sculpture world, uh, graphic design, as well as all of the engineering kinesiology that is the more normal route. You don't have to take the normal route to be in this field, to be a good part of this field, to have a say. It's kind of a mm -hmm. mix between all of the different parts of, you know, healthcare. Yeah, cool. All right, thank you, Riley. Um, all right, so we're going to move to our panel discussion. And so we'll have everybody together. Um, panel, I cannot necessarily see all of you on the screen at once. I think I've got most of you, but um, feel free to jump in um, and just shout out if you if you have an answer for these questions. Um, all right. Do we have a favorite memory or patient story that one of you would like to share or a couple of you'd like to share? Yes, I, I can start off. Um, yeah, I go for had it. And recently fit a uh, five year old with a prosthetic. It was a trauma um, injury. He's below knee. Um, just, you know, everything. Parents were great. We had some trouble with working on getting the compression from the liners and things like that. But it was the coolest thing when he walked out of the clinic using forearm crutches, came back in a week later, not using anything at all. So how fast and wow. how quickly these kids adapt to anything you throw at them, I think is just yeah. awesome. Resilient, super resilient. Absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll go. I have one from my time in Ecuador. Um, we had a I had a patient who was um, a quad, so didn't they were, had congenital amputations of both hands and legs. So she she didn't have anything. She was she was mobile, and they used to make like just um, ankle foot orthoses and cut off the the plate to help her walk like she had feet and but for her hands they had never given her anything so now that she oh, was wow. a little bit older um we decided like maybe we can try to do something for her and her feet mm -hmm. she was 14 but if you looked at her shoe it was like the size of a five-year-old so we made something yeah. that was more her size like a teenager mm -hmm. and gave her just simple um prosthetic um tools to eat with um, and it was just amazing to see her personality change from when we first got there to the end, because her just being able to cut and like feed herself was something she had never been able to do. And her parents were crying and she would just, she just had oh my so much joy and she like her confidence just increased so much with that little, like just being able to feed yourself. So like the simple things are what matter yeah. in this field. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome story. All right, so let's move on to another question. Let's see. Um, what did you do in high school or college to, I think you guys, some of you have kind of answered this a little, but maybe it was post high school or college, but what did you do in high school or college to explore pop? Anyone, uh, anyone? Ahmad, do you wanna go? Okay. Briefly touch on it. So, um... Like I mentioned earlier, my final project in college was related to OMP. So the the way I explored it is I 3D printed a foot um, and did some cool. mechanical testing on it to see if it would survive the rigors of daily use, which it didn't at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, but that's <laughs> that that was kind of, kind of my gateway into pop. Cool. Did anybody take any like classes or do any kind of activities before they got introduced? I'm not touched Jordan, on this that you can, uh, there's no clinician. Well, there are clinicians that'll turn you away, but most clinicians will not turn you <laughs> away if you reach out to individual clinics and you ask, can I come into the clinic and just observe? 
when you do that, your role is just shadowing. So you kind of just stand there and learn as much as you can and see as much as you can. But that is a great thing to do, whether you're in high school or college. My first time shadowing was my second year of uh, engineering school, but mm -hmm. you could definitely do that two years earlier. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Riley. I was just going to put in, I am um, not necessarily directly related, but to the field. I worked with um, teaching swim lessons to individuals with disabilities, specifically children. Um, so seeing and, you know, engineering minds go, huh, I wonder if there's something that could help them out with swimming. How do we make them float or, or kick better so that they can learn and be safe in the water? And so that was kind of a, an introduction, at least to the individuals that you would be working with in this field. And I really appreciated that going through school. I was introduced to it prior to ever learning about any of the yeah. tools to help. Yeah, it was kind of an introduction of working with children. Yeah. I have to cool. say, actually, um, I was, I had no introduction to prosthetics before actually entering the master's program at Northwestern. So um, um, it, curiosity is definitely very good. So, <laughs> <laughs> even if you don't get a chance, but um, yeah, it was, it was definitely very eye-opening to step into the program and mm -hmm. to basically come from like a no foundation, at least when it comes mm -hmm. to prosthetics. So um, basically be, you know, have an open eye for, for different ideas and um, parts of the medical field, basically. Yeah. Great. All right. So I think uh, Ahmad, I think, I heard you had some pictures of your latest projects, which were for a dog to help out a dog, right? Um, I think they're gonna put those up for us. And if you do wanna walk through the project a little bit. Yeah, I was gonna say, please don't ask me to there it is. Figure, figure out how to share it because I can. <laughs> they got um, you, they got you. <laughs> there you go. So this is Gus, um, he was, um, uh, being seen at one of our clinics in Louisville, which is a little bit uh, distance from us, but that's one of the benefits of the workflow that I work in is a digital workflow. So everything can be transmitted uh, online. Um, so uh -huh. the component for Gus that I made is the gray section, the foot, uh, as it were, in the middle uh, mm -hmm. picture, you can see it be printed. It's made out of a flexible material and the oh, structure cool. on the inside affects the rigidity of it, of how, uh, wow. how much, uh, rigid, soft, or hard it feels. Um, and the text on site uh, built the little, uh, you can see the rainbow colored tie dye colored body jacket for him. Uh -huh. the, the metal pylon is a component used for people. Um, and animal prosthetics is not uh, really uh, a, a big field, as it were. So there aren't any components made for animals. Most of the components are repurposed. Um, mm -hmm. so it, this was, this was a fun project to work on. Cause it, like I said, everything we do is different, but this was kind of a, a little bit more so. Yeah. That's really cool. And how did, how did Gus, is it Gus? Did you say it was yep. Gus? <laughs> yep. How did Gus do with the leg? Uh, so initially, uh, I, this is the second dog I've worked with. They're pretty apprehensive cause you're try oh, hugging a dog foreign. that you don't know. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they freak out a little bit, but once they start moving around and they realize that they can rest their weight on uh, a side yeah. that didn't exist before, they, they take to it pretty quickly. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, great. Thank you, Mud. And I think we've got some photos for Riley um, that are to, a, a little bit about her work environment, environment and a little bit more about the collaboration that you have um, there you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing here? Yeah, so the first, uh, I don't know which way you guys are seeing it, but there is a partial hand prosthetic. Um, again, yeah, that's first, I think. Yeah, they're, um, you know, super unique. It's a combination of silicone, which is that dark kind of matted black carbon fiber, um, reinforced fingers. These ones are purely mechanical, so they have to be moved and released. 
there are options for um, muscle innervated ones that move kind of based on muscles, um, flexing and relaxing. But for him, his fingers were so short, we just didn't have that option. So that's that first one. The second one is a bilateral um, above knee patient. He had not walked for 10 years, um, got him in these knees locks. So he kind of walks with peg legs, but is up and walking now. Um, had some trauma early in life, had prosthetics early, and then kind of it got too hard for him. So didn't wear him for a long time. And we're now working mm -hmm. on getting him back down to reasonable weight, getting him activity up moving forward. And then mm -hmm. the last one is one of the few ones that we can directly influence. Um, it is a cranial remolding orthosis or a crow helmet. Um, you see these with kiddos under the age of one generally, but really under the age of 18 months. And it's for kids that don't have a normal or within normal shaped head. We can actually directly influence that and with and direct growth so that they grow to be more rounded or more within those normal range. Um, again, working in a pediatric clinic with our um, physical therapists, a lot of entrances require that physical therapist piece to get these helmets mm -hmm. paid for. So being able to work directly with the physical therapist, then pull us in if they see something or us pull them. And if, hey, we need a physical therapist consult on this kiddo. Mm -hmm. So direct cool. uh, access to how things change for a kiddo. And as they grow, it's really interesting. Yeah, I can imagine that it's like, always changing. They're always needing new modifications and, and new devices because they're just keep growing. I know I have two kids. <laughs> they're yeah. always growing and needing new clothes and shoes. Um, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Riley. Um, okay. So I think the, our last set of photos that we're going to do are from Sydney before we move into our um, audience questions. So Sydney, you want to tell us a little bit about this project? Yes, this was like my prize project. It took almost two years <laughs> to finally get this one done. So it's oh, wow. really lots of relief and happiness with this one. Yeah, um, I bet. Because with insurance and everything, this guy, he he really went through a lot to get these. And I was very ex excited. So he has, like Riley had mentioned, partial hands. Um, and he really just needed something basic just on the um with his left hand to just grasp and hold like you see him holding uh -huh. the the i think that's some baby powder like he hasn't been able yeah. to grasp and hold anything in a long time just because he doesn't have the thumb on that side and so he's he always struggled to drop um things yeah and on his right side we we were able to get him um, two more fingers to just more like brace things his middle finger is kind of stuck in that hook, so he can't extend it. But just to be able to have, be able to hold things securely is what he wanted. And he's a truck driver, so being able to hold the steering wheel, yeah, hold his phone, zip things up, like it was amazing. He he, all he the things that we that. take for granted. <laughs> yes, yes. And now he has all of that after two years. So I'm very excited for this one. Wow. Cool. Very cool. I'm sure that really like made a huge difference for him. Oh, it did. Like he was able, they have zippers on the other side and oh, okay. he, he zipped it up. Like it was nothing. Like it was so easy for him. I was amazed. Awesome. I, I was happier than he was. I'm just like, oh my <laughs> gosh. Like I was the best hype man that whole day for him. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So I think I think we're going to go ahead and take some questions from the audience. Um, let's see here. First question. Um, did you ever make a mistake that made you want to quit? That's a tough one. Anyone would take that one? So I, can I can, know. I'm not one. <laughs> I, okay, go I ahead. Won't made me want to quit but made me question things, went back and, you know, is this really something that I wanted to do? And you have to go back and go, no, 
I, I do want to change people's lives. This is how I want to do it. Um, mine wasn't necessarily a patient, but it took me a while to pass my board exams. I had to do them a couple of times. And every time that happens, it's like, oh, it's a lot of work. I didn't do it. Maybe this isn't right. And you start questioning everything that you've done. So being able to look back and go, you know what, I'm going to fight move forward and keep pushing because this truly is something that I want to do. Great. Okay. If we don't have, is any, you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to mention the beauty about our profession is you can pretty much redo something that you failed at doing. You can remake a brace. You can mm. set up a leg. You can reset it up. You can do anything kind over again. Do no like harm is the first rule, but <laughs> if it's not on a patient, you can redo it if you need to. Failure yeah. is what you're going to experience in this field. Like I tell residents all the time, if you don't fail in residency, you're not having a great residency. Like you're not learning if you're not failing. So, yeah. Very true. Very true. Okay. So we have a question for specifically Jordan. Um, Dishka is asking what is difficult was it difficult to switch from mechanical engineering to healthcare this is a great question uh the switch from mechanical engineering into healthcare is becoming more and more viable and, and done more and more and it brings up a great point that when you're going through your college degree Try to find out what area of the health profession you want to go into. And if it is ONP, look at the requirements that those ONP schools have, because there's going to be classes that you wouldn't typically take for your core classes that are going to be required for admission. For me, I was required to take anatomy and physiology one in my engineering degree, but my grad program required me to take anatomy and physiology two in undergrad. So that smoothed my transition a lot because I was already taking those health classes while I was still in engineering. Design mm -hmm. early so that you can put those classes in early. <laughs> Don't do as I do and take a bunch of credit overrides in your final semesters to make sure that you're taking enough <laughs> classes. Yep, that's good. That's good advice. Okay, so um, Kelsey, this is for anybody on the panel. Kelsey asks, um, and I think we touched on this a little bit, but maybe we can go into a little bit more detail of ways that uh, you can get hands-on experience like shadowing, volunteering, or interning um, in a clinical setting. Does anybody want to go into more depth on that one? So I can. Right. So the biggest thing is it depends on the clinician that you're seeing, the clinic that you're at, how mm -hmm. much hands-on experience you're going to get. The more shadowing time you do, the more willing practitioners generally are to giving you more um, independence on working with things, trialing things out. The best thing you can do if you want some experience is go to your local clinic. There generally is one and just ask. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great advice. Oftentimes and I know on our... Sorry. Ahead, Oftentimes you'll be able to find contact information on a website for a local clinic too. So if you just search like prosthetics and orthotics near me, there will be lots of different clinics in your area, most likely. And then if you just go to their website, they almost always have a drop down tab that's like need our team and have an email that would be good to reach out to. Or if they don't have an email, feel free to call the front desk and just tell them that you're a student, you're interested in learning they normally will be able to help you and point you to the right person. Or you can ask one of our ambassadors. Um, if you visit the whatispop.org website, we can connect you with one of these fine people. And uh, I bet you they could help find something um, for you as well as, you know, something close nearby or somebody that they know or point you in the right direction. Um, okay, so... I like this one a lot. This is from Ella. She says, um, as an art and science loving person that has no background whatsoever in engineering, is it easy or are there a lot of job opportunities in POP that don't need engineering capabilities? There is a level of, uh, 
there's a level of, of mathematics that is, is required just from like the academic standpoint. But I do know a lot of people that are more artistically focused than engineering focused in the field, uh, specifically technicians. I, I actually have a very good friend of mine who's a technician who was a uh, ceramics major. He has his master's in ceramics and used that to move into the field. And that's on the technician side, but there's nothing saying that you can't be a great clinician just because you don't understand like structural engineering. That's kind of the beauty of orthotics and prosthetics is that what we do is very patient centered and very artistic. So we're not making the knees. Engineering companies are making the knees. We're just providing mm -hmm. them with the patient with our own artistically made devices for them. So don't fret at all if that's <laughs> if you are not engineering minded. Uh, and even some of my panelists, I'm sure, can jump in who are exercise science. Yes, <clears throat> I wanted to chime in and say it's um, it's definitely a, a big people um, a type of job as well. So um, engineering aside, it's it, re it really is dealing with the patient and trying to solve their problem um, with knowledge of, you know, forces ground reaction forces, what the the device will provide that patient. So it's kind of, it's, you're taking all the knowledge that you do learn from, you know, from POP and um, the education that you do um, you receive and basically trying to cater it to that patient's needs. So you'll be okay without, right. you know, advanced calculus. <laughs> <laughs> I actually That's knew she somebody really else. To know. <laughs> I knew somebody else that majored in comic book art and learned anatomy through that and became a clinician. Whoa. Hey, look. Very, very cool. Um okay, so this is for everybody too. Um, I hope I don't butcher your name. Avali is asking, um, do you find that these jobs to be fun, exciting, or enjoyable? And have you grown to love this career? I think I can answer that for everybody and say yes, but I'll let you guys elaborate. Anyone to pop on? Absolutely. Everything about it's gratifying. Every time somebody comes in in a wheelchair, walks out on their own two feet or with a prosthetic that you made, or even um, in the orthotic world, a child comes in, can't walk, you put them in a gait trainer and watch them walk and ex be able to explore their world. It just reinvigorates you into, yeah, okay, this is what I want to do. Again, that smile for me, the brighter the smile, the better off I job I did. And as long as I can put a smile, then we're all good. <laughs> Great. Anybody else? I also think pop, um, it's not a, a high stress type of job. Um, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, everyone here on the panel, they do kind of go home and they do think about, you know, this patient or this device that I'm working with that you know, try to solve problems at, when they're at home. But I don't think it's, it's a, it's a job where you're um, like a life or death situation. So like Sydney was saying that we can always correct our mistakes as long as we take the, the right, you know, um, precautions and protocols. And we're very honest with the patient of what we actually need to achieve. Um, yeah. So I love the job. Yeah. Yeah. So there can be some work-life balance and, and you, you know, not necessarily stressed out, super stressed out at work is what I'm hearing. <laughs> and it's rewarding as, as Riley mentioned. Okay. So we got another question. Cassie is asking, how did you all go about choosing your graduate program? And were you drawn to any particular schools? We'll start with the graduate program part. For me, I was somewhere cold <laughs> and I was like, I need to go <laughs> wanted to be warm. warm. <laughs> I wanted to go somewhere warm. That did not work out. I still went to Eastern Michigan. So <laughs> Girl, I did, I failed. Wrong, I failed. Totally I, wrong spot. <laughs> I applied to multiple schools. How I chose was one economically, like the cost of school. Basically every program, yeah. you're, you should get the same education. Um, 
But for me, it was connecting with the graduate program directors. So I emailed them and just asked a few questions. And one of them just turned out to be awesome. And I clicked with her very well. And that's how I ended up in Michigan instead of going more <laughs> south where I wanted to be. Um, but I don't regret the decision. Hey, but you you're you're back in Texas, right? So you're warm. <laughs> oh yes, I had to. I couldn't, I can't survive the cold. <laughs> okay, great. I, <laughs> I went from very, very cold to Southern Cal for grad school. Um, and now I'm in South Dakota, so you know, really cold. Um, but you know, my choice was I had moved all over the place and I knew I wanted to stay on the West Coast. So when I applied to schools, I tried to stay where I wanted to work because those are the um, the people that you meet in school kind of help lead that career path. So since I knew I wanted to stay on the West Coast, I went to school on the West Coast. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And for me, what... Um was the, the real deciding factor was Northwestern's uh, hybrid program. So um, yeah. having a lot of the program online was uh, very helpful because it, it allowed me to, to work while I was in school and to compartmentalize different areas of um, basically school and work. Uh, and then also the transition to Chicago when it was full in person. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and where were yeah. you coming on from where were you at when, before you had to go in person in Chicago? I was in New York. Okay. Yeah. Not too far. Not yeah. Too far. <laughs> yeah. Only like, it's know. still East coast. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to, I did a lot of, I did a lot. <laughs> I had maybe like three jobs, not out of like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> need, but I was like working in landscaping. I was personal training. I was working at oh my a goodness. clinic. Um, so basically, uh, Northwestern gave me a lot of a lot of room <laughs> while I was, you know, obviously learning about O and P uh, didactic. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, that's I really love the program. And then at the end of it, um, they also it it goes back online. So then I was able to to start my residency early, kind of. Oh, yeah. Okay. Not on paper, but um, at well, least basically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to yeah, start yeah. the residency and get the ball rolling um, cool. while in school. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then the last question I've heard that we have time for is, um, this is kind of a philosophical question, uh, looking five to 10 years into the future um, for a new pop professional, how do you think the day to day will look like? Will it be different? Will it be the same? Anyone want to take that one? Technology is so rapidly advancing in our field that in five to 10 years, when you're entering the field, uh, it's going to be incredible. We're going to continue to grow in 3D printing, continue to grow in our control of these devices. Like right mm -hmm. now, a great example would be that uh, the control that we have of a hand is fairly limited. So when somebody loses their hand, we can give them an electric one but it's not gonna articulate like ours do. Like I can put my hand in any position I want as fast as I want. And in five to 10 years, that is going to be changing. We're gonna get better technology, better control patterns, and people are gonna be able to really be getting this mobility back. It's gonna look a lot more like Star Wars and <laughs> a lot more <laughs> like the Marvel universe. And that's that's true. And that's what's so amazing is we get to be at the forefront of that. Yeah. Ahmad, do you want to jump in? I know you um, you do a lot of technical work, and I think yeah. that this is kind of right up your alley. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think in five to 10 years, a lot of um, device production is going to be more on site just because of the availability and uh, drop in price of the 3D printers. Mm -hmm. I think AI will also be a component. Um, I think one of the reports I was reading, they were saying, oh, uh, pop, the pop field is one of the fields that is uh, a bit immune to AI, uh, but there are certain, it, you, it can certainly be used as a tool. So mm -hmm. um, some clinics are using it for note-taking, things of that nature. So you'll be exposed to that. 
Um, yeah, we just dropped a podcast, actually, um, ABC did. We uh, interviewed somebody, uh, a clinician, who's using um, AI in their practice. So yeah. um, lots um, of different ways to use it. Yeah, there's osseo integration. So there. Oh, yeah, uh, that's a good one. So now you're getting implants directly into bone that uh, connect to the prosthetic device. So things are changing rapidly and uh, the landscape could be pretty different within five to 10 years. Sure. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Do we think we covered it pretty good? All right. Well, I'm pumped up. I don't know if our audience is pumped up, but I'm like real, I'm excited. Like, I feel like I need to go make a career change now <laughs> from marketing to OMP. No, I just get to make you guys look awesome, which, you know, it's like a trickle down effect. <laughs> all right. So I think that's all the time we have. I just wanted to say thank you all for joining us today and learning about what is pop in the pop field. Um, you can visit www.whatispop.org um, and be sure to follow us on TikTok, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And yeah, if you have questions, reach out to us. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening.